We're just thrilled for our concluding speaker to assemble together here in the Joseph Smith Auditorium and to hear from Noel B. Reynolds. Noel and I met uh, a few years ago as we were both undergraduate students here and both of us involved in the uh, student government offices of the academic area here on campus. And uh, we were struggling through school then and uh, we both left and went out east to the Boston area for our graduate studies. Uh, Noel graduated from BYU in 1967, originally from California. For me, he's always been a Wyoming cowboy coming from Cody Star Valley area. After receiving his undergraduate degree here from BYU, he received his uh, master's and, and doctorate degrees uh, from Harvard, Harvard, excuse me. Uh, his PhD was in political uh, philosophy and in 1970, he returned here to BYU, where he's been a part of our faculty and administration since. He currently is serving as the Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies here at BYU, an appointment he's had for three years. He's also a professor of political science. He's taught a variety of courses here on campus and back at Harvard and in Edinburgh, Scotland, and even at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, courses in philosophy, law, American heritage, and religion. His scholarly interests include the philosophy of law, the founding of America, authorship studies, Plato, electronic religious texts, and the Book of Mormon. Just very narrow focus, as you notice. At BYU, he's uh, had a, a variety of uh, different uh, administrative positions along with his academic career. He's also served as president of the Foundation for uh, Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, otherwise known as FARMS and with other groups that have studied a variety of topics. He's helped write and edit uh, a number of books dealing with a range of topics, many of them uh, Book of Mormon and uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, oriented. He's also served as one of the editors of the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. And if this hasn't been enough to keep him busy, he's also been a bishop three times, served in a state presidency on two high councils, recently was re released as the president of the BYU First State. And if that isn't enough to keep him busy and out of trouble, he and his wife, Sydney, she can definitely keep him out of trouble, uh, they are the parents of 11 children. How many grandchildren? About 11? <laughs> Is that 12? I want two more coming. I see that's why we're not quite sure how to count some of these fractions, I guess. But anyway, we're just thrilled to have Noel be our concluding speaker as he makes some comparisons between Moses and Lehi and aspects of the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon. Noel? Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm delighted to be here today and very honored by this invitation. And I hope that uh, what I'll be sharing with you will be uh, interesting, enlightening, uh, even inspiring for you, as it has been for me. I thought I'd start with a uh, Sidney B. Sperry story. I didn't have the opportunity of knowing uh, Brother Sperry personally. Uh, he was very near retirement when I was an undergraduate at BYU. But uh, a few years ago, I was working on a project, uh, a research project on the ways in which we have uh, accepted, uh, used, uh, treated the Book of Mormon in the 20th century as a Latter-day Saint community. And one of the things I learned there was that in the earlier part of this century, uh, among educated Latter-day Saints, there was a lot of skepticism about the Book of Mormon and uh, not a uniform acceptance of it, even among people who were uh, teaching here and other places, even some who were teaching religion. And in that uh, research, I interviewed uh, David H. Yarn, whom some of you may know as a, uh, one of the beloved deans of religious education at BYU, uh, who at that time, at the time of this story, was a student of Dr. Sperry's. And he tells the story of uh, uh, 
being in the office of Sperry, who was uh, the first Latter-day Saint to receive a PhD in biblical languages and the first academically trained full-time religion teacher at BYU. Brother Yarn says, I remember being in Dr. Sperry's office when one who was considered a religious skeptic came in to visit with him. Upon learning that Dr. Sperry was writing about the Book of Mormon, the visitor said cynically, Oh, Sid, you don't believe that stuff about the Book of Mormon, do you? Dr. Sperry, in a courteous and respectful manner, but in firm and unmistakable terms, bore a resolute testimony concerning the Book of Mormon. And each time I review that little episode, uh, I, I ponder the question, how much do we owe today a time when the uh, educated uh, uh, members of the church and certainly the academics at BYU and elsewhere strongly believe in the Book of Mormon, strongly endorse it, use it in so many ways in their lives and in their teaching. How much do all of them owe to a Dr. Sidney Sperry, uh, who was very much alone in that kind of a stance uh, in his own time? Uh, I certainly am grateful for any impact that that has had on us, on BYU, and uh, giving me and others the, the opportunity to, to see the Book of Mormon as something that should be included in, in our serious scholarly work. I want to uh, share my testimony as I start today, how grateful I am for the Book of Mormon, for the, uh, those great prophets who brought it forth, uh, not only for Joseph Smith in our own day, but for a Nephi and a Lehi, uh, for a Mormon and a Moroni, and all those in between them, who gave so much in their lives to make this record possible and to preserve it uh, for us. This research project that I'm reporting today started in a Sunday school class. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever got an idea in a Sunday school class, inspired by it, to go on and do a research project uh, I don't think I had before, but I was this time. And so we were reading the first chapter of Second Nephi. And a person sitting on the row in front of me raised his hand and said, so what, why does Lehi say in this uh, chapter, why, in, in his, the speech, the address he's giving to his sons, why does he say statutes and commandments? Now, I'll have to admit, my first thought internally was, come on, everybody knows what statutes are. <laughs> but then it hit me. Statutes and commandments, of course, is from Deuteronomy, and that's Moses. And I hadn't thought about Lehi's address in that way before. And so as I began right then to read Deuteronomy from start to finish and went home and reread it several more times um, and started making lists and comparisons with uh, that chapter of, first Nephi, of Second Nephi, it became clear to me that, ne that Lehi in, had chosen in this closing address to his family to invoke repeatedly the key themes of the book of Deuteronomy, which of course contains the farewell addresses of Moses to the Israelites before they crossed the Jordan and went over into the Promised Land. In fact, there are 14 of these themes that Lehi borrows from, uh, from Deuteronomy, and that will form the backbone of what I want to present today. It has previously been noted that Nephi relates the founding events of the Nephite people in such a way that his readers will see him as a second Moses. What has not been noticed to this point is that his father Lehi also employed this same typology in his farewell address in order to persuade his descendants of his divine calling and their new covenant relationship to the same God that had given the promised land to ancient Israel. Well, in this paper, then, I'm going to show that Lehi had used this device in an attempt to help his descendants understand their true situation, obligations, and opportunities, and that in portraying himself as a second Moses, Nephi was following a model invoked at least two decades earlier by his own father. 
and established centuries earlier by a long series of Old Testament authors. While we do not have Lehi's account of the events reported in the small plates, we know that the leadership was very much a shared thing, with Lehi's role preeminent in the beginning and Nephi's responsibility surfacing quickly in the Brass Place episode and repeatedly thereafter at critical junctures. As with Nephi, the actual sequence of historical events made it easy to portray Lehi as a Moses figure, for he led his people out of a wicked land because of commands received in visions from God through the wilderness, across the sea, and to a promised land. And then, after delivering a farewell address, he died, leaving it to others to establish this newly covenanted people in the promised land under younger leadership. We have not adequately understood to this point why we should not view these comparisons by the first Nephite prophets as either original or audacious. Recent scholarly analyses now show that if Lehi and Nephi truly had all the experiences they describe, their people, as believing students of the Old Testament, would have expected Lehi and Nephi to draw these very comparisons, at least implicitly. Beginning with Joshua, the Old Testament writers portrayed the great prophets and heroes in ways that would highlight their similarities with Moses, the prophet predecessor, whose divine calling and powers were not questioned by anyone. For indeed, he had led Israel out of Egyptian bondage. With many mighty miracles, he had led the Israelites through the Red Sea and had sustained them in the wilderness for 40 years. Through his appeals for divine favor, Israel had prevailed over all enemies. And in the view of all Israel, Moses had gone up into the mountain, had spoken with God, and had returned to deliver covenants and commandments that would define Israel from that time forward. Those who had rebelled against him were destroyed by divine power. And ironically, now that he was safely out of the way and unable to in interfere with any sinner's life, he was revered by the rebellious and the obedient alike, making him a powerful icon for successor prophets to invoke in their attempts to influence their own contemporaries to be obedient and faithful. Scholarly discussion of the Moses typology has been dominated largely by the New Testament allusions to Moses as the precursor of Christ, or to Christ as a new Moses. Indeed, the problem scholars have always had with interpretive emphases on typologies is that they have generally been used to prove the truth of the New Testament claims to the divinity of Christ. The logic seemed to be that if some ancient biblical type were reproduced in a later anti-type, one has to conclude that this is evidence of the same God working through history and that the salvation brought about by Christ on behalf of all men was therefore intentionally prefigured in the Old Testament types. The word type comes from the New Testament tupos, and with, jo with Moses as the type, pattern or model, Christ becomes the antitype. Paul, Matthew, and John all find in the Old Testament types that, like prophecies, are fulfilled in the Christ and the New Covenant. The flood is a type for the antitype baptism. Adam is a type of Christ. And Joseph, Mo, pardon me, and Moses is also a type that prefigures Christ, the new Moses. Interpreting the Old Testament typologically assumes that the same God is behind both and that he is in charge of history. In general, the types of the Old Testament were understood to prefigure the anti-types of the New Testament. This pre approach presupposes the unity of the Old Testament and New Testament and that the active involvement of God to save and deliver people in history is consistent. It pre presupposes, therefore, that the meaning of the Old Testament is finally unclear without the New Testament as that of the New Testament without the Old Testament. Typological interpretations have been faddish at different times in Christian history and being merged with unconstrained allegory by patristic writers persisted in a distorted form up to the time of the Reformation when literal interpretation of scriptural texts 
returned to fashion. And typologies were again assumed to report historical fact. The excesses of analogical interpretations brought disrepute on the typological method with which they were confused and were especially repugnant to 19th and 20th century scholars who were not uniformly committed to the underlying religious assumptions. However, in this last decade, it has become clear, very clear in the work of several Bible scholars, that typological interpretations were incorporated almost routinely throughout the text of the Old Testament itself, and that the authors who used most implicit, mostly implicit typologies we're only trying to show their prophet heroes as proper successors to Moses and as spokesmen and instruments of Moses as God. What this also shows is that Israelites steeped in the Old Testament must have actually expected the prophetic claims of new prophets to be bolstered by adaptations of the Moses typology to their particular circumstances. Their ability to do this convincingly might even be one demonstration of a genuine prophetic calling. Although the history of typological interpretations focuses principally on the New Testament, Dale Allison has recently demonstrated, I think beyond doubt, that it was originally an Old Testament tradition, and that it is pervasive in its many books and in the later rabbinic literature. As Moses led Israel out of Egypt, and through the Red Sea on dry ground and eventually to the Promised Land, so Joshua led the people out of the wilderness across the River Jordan on dry ground and into the Promised Land. And on that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they stood in awe of Moses. Allison goes on to collect from the scholarly and interpretive literature persuasive examples of well uh, developed Moses typologies in the biblical accounts of several other prophets. Let's look first at how the one with Joshua is developed. The parting of the Red Sea, reference to dry ground and two or three other things, those, those, the parting of the Jordan River, and the same additional terminology is used. And here's the way that the author of Joshua starts to set this up. Moses sent men to spy, get you up and see the land, in numbers. This saying is repeated in the account of Joshua. Joshua sent men to spy secretly, saying, go, view the land. Moses, all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away, fear and dread shall fall upon them. And of Joshua, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, and our hearts did melt neither did there remain courage in any man. And the Lord said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereupon thy, whereon thou standest is holy ground, the Lord speaking to Moses at the burning bush, and to Joshua, the captain of the Lord's host, I loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereupon thy, whereon thou standest is holy. And so you can see the, by the way the author of Joshua tells the story in these first few chapters, we are forcibly reminded of Moses and see Joshua as a second Moses. I'm going to give you quickly some other examples, and I won't take as long uh, with each one, but take Gideon. Uh, again, now, notice that we're picking out different parts of Moses' life to compare with the new person because there are other things in the life of someone else that could be compared back to Moses. And so here we have uh, Moses working for his father-in-law, a priest, and uh, called by a divine messenger to deliver Israel, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Well, Gideon was working for his father, who is a pagan priest, and is called by a divine messenger to deliver Israel, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. And then we have... Uh, Moses claims unworthiness, and the Lord says, Certainly I will be with thee. The same thing happens with Gideon, and the same phrase, Surely I will be with thee. Moses then receives signs of God's power. As he throws down his staff, it becomes a serpent. He puts his hand in his cloak, and it becomes leprous, and so forth. 
Gideon also receives signs as he is he takes some cooked food out, puts it out on a table, and fire comes from heaven and consumes it. Um, Moses sees the Lord face to face. Gideon sees the Lord face to face. And then the story involves bondage to, of Israel to the Egyptians. They call on the deliverer, the destruction of foreign deities, followed by holy war, and again the same thing. And that's, of course, the main part of Gideon's story. Let's look at Samuel. The, the biblical tradition repeatedly refers to Samuel, links Samuel to Moses, as we see in Psalms 99 and in Jeremiah 15. That comparison is cemented by this episode. Israel is in captivity. There have been seven days of plague uh, in this, the Moses side of it. The, Israel is released and the Egyptians are despoiled. For Samuel, the story goes, the Ark of the Covenant is in captivity. There are seven months of plagues. The ark is released, and a gold uh, a guilt offering is sent. The hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, Moses, and the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod. The Lord says, The cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. The Lord says, I have looked upon my people because their cry has come unto me in Samuel. And so uh, it goes, well, some of the chief examples of these kinds of typologies in the Old Testament can be found in analyses that have been made by uh, scholars and rabbis uh, over the centuries of the uh, names that you see on this list. Uh, David, Elijah, Josiah, Ezekiel, and so forth. Uh, even including uh, Hillel, and then the prophet like Moses and the Messiah. All of them uh, get this typological treatment where they are uh, portrayed uh, as a Moses. So the assumptions that can be uh, derived is, as we look at the way the Old Testament authors use this technique, the type uh, of typology, uh, we can learn some of their assumptions. Number one, uh, by repeating a chain of duplicated historical patterns, they find this testifying of one true God, that uh, who was the God of each of the people involved in the typology. Uh, the second assumption is that written accounts of an, and events of people are best filled with religious meaning through silent allusions to earlier events and people. And so as a reader would be going along and sense these references, recognize the repeated language, uh, this would give the, what they are reading meaning that isn't actually articulated in words. And the third assumption is that recent events that parallel holy history become part of that history. And so Samuel is part of Moses' story, and David is part of Moses' story, and Jesus is part of Moses' story. There are many kinds of typologies, and they are constructed from different kinds of materials. Uh, from his study, Allison extracted a list of six ways in which the account of one person or event, the antitype, can be constructed to allude to a prior person or event as a type. The two no two historical figures are identical, nor do they live identical lives. For any two such figures, the story of their lives could be told in such a way as to avoid any suggestion of similarity. Alternatively, selected facts can also be used to emphasize common features. By constructing the account of a second feature to evoke the reader's memories of a prominent earlier figure, a writer can suggest strongly to the reader that the later person plays a similar role in God's theater as did the first. The ways a writer can make this suggestion uh, include the following. First, an explicit statement or reference. And remember, Joshua was introduced as he, uh, the people were in awe of him as they were of Moses. So that, uh, that Moses is invoked in the actual language. More often, silent borrowing of textual elements uh, is used. And so uh, pieces of text from the one story will crop up in the other story uh, so that you think of it. Of course, this assumes that you know those texts pretty well. Um, 
But think of the analogy. Uh, you, this isn't true of me, but uh, a lot of people can just hear someone hum a bar of a tune and they know the whole, uh, the whole musical number that it refers to. Uh, this is the same thing. It's exactly the same kind of thing. If you know those texts well, then a little excerpt or borrowing without any mention of the purpose can evoke for you that earlier text. A third one is silent pointing to a similarity of circumstances. So just, and, and the example here will be uh, Moses in Deuteronomy is speaking to the Israelites just before he dies. Lehi in chapter 1 of 2 Nephi is speaking to his people just before he dies. Similarity of circumstance. Borrowing of key words and phrases. I'll show you a number of these borrowings uh, later. Um, five, following a similar narrative structure. Uh, here, the narrative structure for Lehi is the farewell uh, address as it was uh, for um, Moses. And finally, imitating patterns of words and syllables. Well, Lehi's farewell address appears uh, to all to use all but the first and the last of these devices in signaling to his auditors that he has been called and directed of God, as was Moses of old, to lead a branch of Israel into a new dispensation. Because of the long history of abuse of the typological methods of interpretation, Allison has also assembled several guidelines abstracted from Old Testament usage that will help interpreters be objective and restrained in identifying and defending solid and substantial typologies, the kind we might reasonably infer were intended, intended by their authors. It seems to me that the Book of Mormon typology uh, follows these guidelines very well. The first one, the text must allude to another that already existed at the time it was written. The small plates, the Book of Deuteronomy. Second, the type and its textual source must have been important to the author of the text which makes the allusion. Well, Deuteronomy was an important text, and Moses was important to the Nephites. In his farewell, ad <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, third, combinations of different devices of allusion, allusion, alluding to them, make it much less likely that these similarities are accidental. Uh, and again, uh, I've just shown that Lehi's address does that. The fourth, the type alluded to must be sufficiently prominent so that the allusions will be evident to most qualified readers. And clearly, again, with, with it being uh, Moses and Deuteronomy, that's easy. Fifth, typologies that are known and appreciated are more convincing when evoke, invoked anew. Sixth, finally, two texts are more plausibly related if what they share is out of the ordinary. So if you pick very ordinary things out of their lives, like uh, they both got married, or they both had children, or uh, they both had uh, parents, you know, th th these are not uh, extraordinary things, and they do not a typology make. So they, the, the comparisons need to be on points that are unusual, and this makes those comparisons more convincing to us. Allison has noted further that the Moses typology was used most effectively with transitional figures like Samuel, who had been raised up at a decisive time in Israel's history to close one era and usher in another. Think of Lehi through this. Breaking the Egyptian bondage, overseeing the transition from a theocracy of judges to a monarchy, and inaugurating the age of Torah. The transition under Moses became paradigmatic. It was the prime example of history changing course, of one dispensation giving way to another. So just as it was natural to comprehend any great historical transition as another exodus, so too was it natural to liken Moses, liken to Moses, men who altered the seasons and straddled epics. With this insight, it becomes almost a requirement that Lehi and Nephi be seen by their descendants as antitypes for Moses. The exemplary transitional roles played by Joshua and Samuel are still less dramatic than that of Lehi or Nephi as described in 1 Nephi. 
I've mentioned that Nephi was, um, uh, also presents himself as a Moses figure. Uh, I've, uh, in another publication, I have uh, detailed uh, up to about 21 parallels that Nephi seems to be suggesting between himself and Moses, but let me just give you a few of these. He flees into the wilderness after killing the uh, Moses. We know flees after killing a public official. Of course, Nephi does exactly the same thing. Uh, he leads his people through wilderness over water to the promised land. Uh, that's actually several things, and Nephi does all of those. Uh, his people murmur repeatedly, not to, uh, but they don't outdo Laman and Lemuel. Um, he feeds his people in the wilderness with divine assistance, the manna, and of course, Nephi breaks the bow, and the Lord shows him where to go with his new wooden bow uh, to find food for the people. Uh, Moses goes up into the mountain uh, to speak with God, and the voice of the Lord came unto me, saying, Arise, and get thee into the mountain. And it came to pass that he arose, went up into the mountain, and I cried unto the Lord. And of course, we know the great vision uh, that occurs after that. And finally, uh, in the brass plate story, as Nephi is trying to encourage his brothers, he actually invokes the name of Moses, as he does uh, in uh, chapter 17 as well. Let us be strong like unto Moses. Let us go up. The Lord is able to deliver us, even as our fathers, etc. Our direct evidence that Lehi compared himself to Moses as a rhetorical device to help his children see the divine direction behind his actions comes from Lehi's final speech to his people, as reported in 2, 2 Nephi chapter 1. And Lehi needed to bolster his case, for as his older sons clearly saw, their father had led them out of Jerusalem, not Egypt. It was hard for them to believe that the kingdom of Judah was the wicked and soon-to-be-destroyed place their father described from his visions. The analogy between a thriving and prosperous Jerusalem and an oppressive Egypt of old was not easy for them to assimilate. So in his final words to them, Lehi invoked the very phrases and themes emphasized by Moses in his farewell address to the Israelites, as recorded in Deuteronomy. In so doing, Lehi cast himself in a role similar to that of Moses, the great prophet revered by all Israel in an eloquent attempt to bring his murmuring sons into obedience and acceptance of the successor the Lord had chosen. It was a noble and vain attempt, and its inevitable failure may have been presaged in the awkward logic of the blessings that Lehi gave to his sons. Even so, recorded and perpetuated forever in the family records, Lehi's words would stand for all time, like Deuteronomy for the Israelites, as a witness to his descendants of what the Lord expected them to do. There is good reason to believe I think that Lehi would have been especially familiar with Deuteronomy. Two decades before Lehi received the visions and revelations that sent him and his family into the wilderness, a manuscript, now generally believed to have included all or part of the book of Deuteronomy, had been discovered in the temple. It was the 18th year of the reign of the righteous king Josiah, approximately 621 B.C., who after the discovery went up to the temple with all the people from the least to the greatest, where he read them the book, renewing the covenant contained therein in the presence of the Lord. And all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. The book and this event then provided the basis for Josiah's reforms, by which he overthrew idol worship and centralized the worship of Jehovah at the Jerusalem temple. It might not be too much of a stretch to speculate that Lehi's own covenantal self-understanding derives principally from this event. The discovery of this vision of Deuteronomy, this, pardon me, this version of Deuteronomy, was without doubt the manuscript find of the century, in the same way that the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has been for us in the 20th century. It occurred while Lehi, an exceptionally literate and learned man in the prime of his life, lived in or near Jerusalem. It is even possible that the discovery of this new text provided the motivation for creation of the brass plates as an enlarged and corrected version of the Josephite scriptural record. The apparent fact that the brass plates included some version of Deuteronomy suggests that the brass plates were manufactured after 621 B.C.
Deuteronomy is a powerful book containing the final three addresses of Moses given to the people of Israel before they crossed over the Jordan into their promised land, leaving him behind. Given the enormous population to which these were addressed, it is most reasonable to assume that they were written in the first instance and circulated to ensure that, correct version, that the correct version was made available to all. While scholars generally believe Deuteronomy was given final form during Josiah's reign, some version of the text was definitely included in the brass plates and was believed by Lehi and his people to have been written by Moses. Certainly the text presents itself consistently as a first-person account from Moses with only minimal editorializing to provide context and transitions. I will argue below that Lehi's own final address reflects an intimate knowledge of the text of Deuteronomy, such that Lehi can allude to it at every turn of his own discourse without letting the references distort or detract in any way from his own message. He thus makes Deuteronomy a powerful, though unmentioned, foundation for his own message for all his readers who might know that version of Moses' last words. It may be difficult for modern readers to understand why a prophet like Lehi would find it appropriate to compare himself to Israel's great deliverer prophet. But because Lehi and his people understand their own times in terms of types and shadows of previous times, he really has no choice. If human history is, as Lehi and Nephi clearly understood it, and as their own visions consistently reemphasized to them, a continuing and repeating revelation of the covenant, then God's leading of them out of, his, out of Jerusalem and reinstituting of his covenant with Lehi in a new promised land can only be understood in terms of the Exodus and the roles of Lehi and Nephi in terms of Moses. I will identify 14 mosaic themes and similarities of circumstance that Lehi invokes in 2 Nephi chapter 1 and illustrate some of their closest parallels in Deuteronomy, particularly in chapter 4. Contextually, Lehi evidently saw himself in Moses' awkward position and year after years of leading his family through a difficult wilderness journey beset with almost impossible obstacles which they were able to overcome only after rather obvious divine interventions, his two older sons are still murmuring and possessed of a spirit of rebellion. Lehi now knows that they will not have a lasting and sincere change of heart, and that they will soon depart from the ways and covenants he has taught. But his time is over. Like Moses, he knows he is near death. All he can do now is to leave a blessing and a set of teachings for future generations that may be more receptive to his true message and to the revelations on which it is based. Finally, he will conclude his long sojourn on earth in a farewell address to his people, warning them of the dangers of disobedience to God and reminding them forcefully of the great blessings God has in store to those who remember their covenants and obey his commandments. It is important to emphasize that Lehi sees Deuteronomy only as a parallel and not as a source for his teaching and blessing. Lehi has experienced the same kinds of great visions and other revelations that Moses received. God himself showed Lehi the mixed future of his people. He has seen the salvation of all mankind in a vision. He has beheld the future birth and ministry of the Messiah, the Son of God. He has seen the triumph of God and his people in the last days, and he has beheld God himself on his throne. The last thing Lehi wants to communicate is that Moses' writing is his source. Lehi's vision stand as the as the full basis of his independent witness and authority to prophesy to his children. If all his people had been capable of recognizing the spirit that bears witness of his revelations, he would have had little need for a rhetorical appeal to Moses as a second witness of sorts. But he knows his rebellious older sons, who specifically rejected his visions, calling him a visionary man and he grasps the need for such an additional appeal. And so he phrases his message in terms that repeatedly remind his hearers of Moses' similar message delivered on a similar occasion. At this point, I'm going to go through these 14 
borrowings or references. Uh, I'm going to do this quickly using slides uh, without much explanation uh, as I go along. The first of these is a rehearsal of blessings. Nephi does not include the full record of Lehi's teaching. Instead, he summarized extensively, reporting what, that Lehi spake many things unto them, and rehearsed unto them how great things the Lord had done for them in bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem. Moses had uh, warned the people also, take heed lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. Moses also reminds his people of the direct experiences they've had with God, as Lehi does the same. Moses says that Israel's blessings began from the creation, that they've seen signs and wonders for their benefit, and that they've been given the Ten Commandments. Lehi refers to their knowledge of the creation, the great and marvelous works of the Lord, and the commandments that have been given from the beginning. A second theme is the appointment of a successor. In the Deuteronomy, Moses declares that Joshua, the son of Nun, will be his successor. And of course, Lehi takes great pains in this address to uh, install Nephi uh, as his successor. In both cases, the successor is a prophet ruler, not a king. In the case of Lehi, um, I've argued elsewhere that Nephi was never a king uh, in the sense that his successors were. Um, I'm not going to try and explain that here. The third theme is a prophet's last words. Lehi's perception that his life is near an end drives the timing of his remarks. He describes himself as a trembling parent whose limbs we, he must soon lay down in a cold and silent grave. Moses tells us he must die in the land before going over to Jordan. He's 120 years old this day. And of course, Lehi is aware of his own imminent demise. The fundamental symmetry in the two messages, that of Lehi and Moses, uh, provides the reason for all the other similarity, similarities that Lehi incorporates. For like Moses at a founding moment for the nation of Israel, Lehi must urgently warn his people from sin and call them to obedience to the Lord. Both couch their messages in terms of prophetic warnings about future destructions and scatterings of their people among the nations of the earth. And finally, Moses warns his people that if they don't obey, that they will be cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed and destroyed. And of course, this reminds us of the language of Lehi, uh, as he warns his own family of the curses that await disobedience and of the destruction of both soul and body that will come from such disobedience. Now this is the, the theme that caught my attention in that Sunday school class, uh, the reference to statutes and judgments. Moses refers to the statutes and judgments or the statutes and judgments and commandments over 20 times in the course of his address. Nephi, uh, Lehi invokes this in uh, verse 16. To avoid cursing, Lehi counsels his sons to remember to observe the statutes and judgments of the Lord. One that we're a little more apt to remember is the promise that if they will keep the commandments, they will prosper in the land. Moses says, therefore, keep the words of this covenant and prosper in all that you do. Hearken to these judgments. The Lord will bless thee and multiply thee. And Lehi, of course, is, has this formulation of keeping the commandments and prospering in the land, which is picked up repeatedly by later Book of Mormon writers. Both of them make it clear that they see themselves speaking to a rebellious people. And Moses chides them, you have been a rebellious people against you, the Lord. You, uh, also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Lehi says, reminds them of the rebellions upon the water. And rebel no more against Nephi. You have murmured, he says. And of course, we have lots of examples of that. 
both of these prophets talk about a promised, a choice land. Uh, Moses talks about this good land into which they've been brought. They shall not lack anything in it. Bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he giveth thee. Lehi ups the ante. We have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands, even greater than the land which was given to Moses and the Israelites. And as he concludes, it is a land uh, that is given for their inheritance. This gift of the land and these other blessings are connected to a covenant. And, that's, and the covenant provides the connection, I should say. And so Moses recognized the Lord has done this unto this land. Uh, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord, these other people uh, are driven out. And this land, again, uh, the, the, the Lord's anger was kindled against the land, and they rooted them out of their land. So the connection between the covenant of the land, uh, Lehi turns that around. The Lord hath covenanted this land unto me. Uh, and also in those who be led out of other countries by his hand. Both writers talk about the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. Moses says, The Lord thy God is faithful. He keepeth covenant of mercy with them that love him. If they hearken to his judgments, he shall keep unto them unto the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. Lehi, in the same address, ex emphasizes how merciful the Lord has been to them and his infinite goodness unto this precious land of promise. Each of them talks about this being a, a, a special people. Moses calls them a peculiar people, a holy people, a special people unto the Lord, blessed above all people. Lehi calls them a choice and a favored people of the Lord. And both of, uh, I'm indebted to Jack Waltz for noticing that a parallel between uh, Nephi's formulation of choosing between good and evil, life and death, and a formulation in uh, uh, Deuteronomy. I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Now think of uh, Lehi's sermon on this subject. And I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. And of course, Lehi uh, couches this all in a context of a doctrine of opposition in all things, and then says men are free to choose liberty and eternal life, or to choose captivity and death, and uh, choose eternal life, he says, and not eternal death. Both uh, Lehi and Moses are anxious to acquit themselves before God in this final address. And so they both uh, make the point that they've done what the Lord required of them. Now it's up to the, their hearers to obey and to follow that uh, principle. Uh, Lehi uh, expresses this in the anxiety of his soul. I, would that you should, I desire that you should remember to observe the statutes and judgments of the Lord. Finally, both of them address themselves to future generations. Moses speaks of thy sons and thy sons' sons to a thousand generations. Lehi speaks of a cursing that will come upon the disobedient for many generations. And so, uh, and so it goes. I'd like to conclude with some further comments. Both in Nephi's small plates, generally, and in Lehi's farewell address, Specifically, implicit allusions are made to Moses as a type for both Nephi and Lehi as antitypes. Like Moses, they are important transitional prophet figures. They have seen the future of their own people in vision, and they know in advance that these people will look back on them as founders of their branch of Israel, with a new covenant in a new promised land, just as old Israel looked back to Moses. But like the numerous occasions in the Old Testament where such typologies are drawn, Neither Nephi nor Lehi make these comparisons with Moses explicit. Dale Allison laments the difficulty that modern readers, like bad readers with poor memories, have in detecting these silent allusions to important earlier writings and in appreciating the wealth of additional meaning that such references bring. The Jewish writers tended to assume a far-reaching knowledge of scripture or tradition and so leave it to us 
to describe the implicit. There is no exhibition of the obvious. As another commentator on Isaiah has observed, he seems to take for granted that his hearers know the traditions as well as he does. And so it is that in ancient Jewish narratives, typology consists as a general rule of references that are almost always implicit. When Nephi writes his second record, The Small Plates, in such a way as to portray himself as a Moses figure, he may be following the pattern set almost three decades earlier by his father Lehi. While there is no reason to think Lehi or Nephi set out with an ambition to be a Moses, the circumstances into which the Lord's calls plunged them were very much like Moses' kind of transitional situation, and the connections were not lost on them. Further, the Jewish literary tradition almost demanded that they present themselves as antitypes for Moses. More than almost any of the Moses antitypes of the Old Testament, the facts of Lehi's and Nephi's lives naturally fit the Moses typology. So strong are the natural comparisons that it would have made sense to criticize the Book of Mormon had it not made this kind of connections. Again, Joseph Smith has woven an essential literary feature of ancient Israelite text into the Book of Mormon, the necessity of which was not fully recognized until the end of the 20th century. In fact, had he undertaken to develop Moses' typologies on the basis of the scholarly understanding available in 1828 or 29, he would have gotten it wrong. Further, even though the Moses typologies focused on Lehi and Nephi are sufficiently subtle to have evaded discovery until recently, they are in fact much clearer and more extensive in their development than any of the Old Testament precedents that they imitate. Lehi's last address to his people appears to invoke at least 14 important themes and verbal formulations from the final address of Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy, a text that was well known to and revered by his people. When these are added to the numerous similarities of historical circumstance, Lehi's intention to invoke Moses as a founder, pardon me, as a type for himself is placed beyond doubt. As with the presentation of Elijah as an antitype of Moses, so does Lehi's farewell address argue that Lehi was in the line of the prophets like Moses. In so doing, Lehi adds the weight of the testimony of Moses and all the successor prophets to his own. This is especially important because, as is often the case with the living prophet, his people were fully accepting of the teachings of the long-dead Moses and his successors, but were rebelling continuously against Lehi and his chosen successor, Nephi. Though Lehi's appeal was successful with only part of the people in the short run, it provided a beacon and a witness to his descendants for centuries, giving them clear guidance whenever they were disposed to conduct themselves according to the will of God. Thank you. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu.